Good evening and, um, good evening and welcome, uh, welcome to Ethology, uh, Ethology, the science of eating. Um, look, thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, my name is Richard Dennis. Uh, I'm, I'm the director of the Australia Institute, but uh, uh, the, I'm, I'm simply... Uh, I, I'm, I'm simply the, uh, uh, the moderator this evening. Uh, this evening's event is organised uh, by the Canberra Environment Centre. Uh, the Canberra Environment Centre uh, work directly with the community to ensure uh, the best environmental outcomes for the ACT uh, through targeted education, information uh, and practical application. The Canberra Environment Centre recognised that a healthy and vibrant community is much more able to take care of itself and its environment than a fragmented one. And it's fantastic to see uh, so many people coming out tonight to, uh, to participate in such an interesting community event. Um, they work to increase community environmental sustainability. Food production is obviously an area that's taken their interest, and it's, uh, as it has with many people in the Canberra community. And the Canberra Environment Centre has been running a series of workshops uh, and events under their local hall theme. Uh, and the consistent question that's been raised, uh, the question uh, that we hope to address tonight, is what's the best diet for Canberra, environmentally speaking? What should we eat? Where should the food come from? How should it be produced? I'm sure by the end of tonight we'll all have agreed on all of the answers to that. <laughs> and uh, uh, look, what I am certain of is that by the end of tonight we'll have all uh, learned something new, uh, hopefully met someone new, uh, and hopefully we leave not just thinking differently, but thinking more uh, about these very important issues. Um, now, uh, before I get started, uh, I should put in a, a brief plug for my own organisation, the Australia Institute. We've recently um, conducted a survey, and, and, and we're just writing up some research into uh, why people grow their own food, uh, who does, who doesn't. Uh, we've looked at um, the uh, people's uh, reasons for growing their own food, uh, whether they're involved in community gardens, if so, why, etc. Uh, that research will come out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and if you sign up, there's a clipboard up the back. Uh, if you sign up on the Australia Institute uh, clipboard, we'll be uh, happy to send you a copy of that. Otherwise, just um, like us on Facebook or subscribe on our email or all the million ways you can keep in touch these days. But, but that research will come out soon and, and we hope it's of interest. So uh, look, tonight uh, it's, it's mainly going to be about our panel. We've, we've asked you to submit questions and uh, some of the questions that have been submitted I'll, I'll be putting to the panel tonight. Um, but uh, before we get underway, I'd just like the panellists to briefly introduce themselves. Um, so this is just about so you know where people are coming from and what experience or expertise they bring to the conversation, and then we'll get down to the uh, to the meatier issue for the vegetarians. <laughs> uh, we'll get down to the meatier issue of what we should or shouldn't be eating, and, and where indeed uh, we should be trying to source that food from. Uh, so we'll just go in this order. Dave, do you want to just start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Uh... I think so. Yeah. Can you hear Dave in the back? Yeah. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, my name's Dave Patton. My formal career was in the field of computing and statistics. Uh, I might bore you with some numbers later on the day. Uh, but I've always had a, a passion for growing organically, growing vegetables, mainly and fruit and vegetables. Um, <coughs> since I was a child at school, we've, we've grown in, in about 40 years ago, I worked the property that we live on now, and since then we've been slowly developing that as an organic farm. Uh, we, I, I finished my formal work in 1997, came back to Australia, and settled down to work full time on the farm, in a more or less retired way, I hope, but that's not the way it worked out. Uh, we opened, we found we could produce as much as we wanted, we could produce more than we could sell, so we looked at opening other retail, other ways of working out other ways of selling <coughs> produce and set up the Capital Region Farmers Market and then a year later set up the Southside Farmers Market and then both of these were up and running 
we then started opening the Chopper by Jones Street, which was stores that we owned. And we opened one in Lyden, and later we opened another one in Curtin. Uh, that pretty much sums up what we're up to now. Uh, all the everything that we produce on the farm at this stage is sold through the markets or through out one of either of our two shops or through uh, another organic shop in Griffith Shops, shopping centre, organic energy. Uh, that pretty much sums up. So you're a newcomer to this issue, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> just, just starting to learn a few things. David? Thank you very much. Um, some similarities and some differences. Um, firstly, I'm a David. David Pearson, I'm an academic at the University of Canberra. I'm relatively new to Canberra, I've been here about four years. I had prior experience in Sydney as an investment banker, so I had a very commercial orientation. And whilst I was investing in banking, I got more and more interested in customers, consumers, and um, what it is, how it is that we and uh, consumers more generally actually go about making decisions. And I just decided to apply that um, experience, <coughs> degree of expertise, to thinking about uh, researching and teaching and ultimately writing about food choices, so food-related choices. So I'm very much a marketing academic, but in the social marketing, so looking at marketing, sharp end marketing tools, but how they can be used for, um, to influence choices for, for social goods. And I guess my orientation is towards giving consumers choice and then giving them information upon which they can make informed choices. Um, my name is David, or David. Um, <laughs> uh, don't know about the other panel over there. Um, I'm doing a PhD at the Australian National University at the Tennis School of Environment and Society. And you might want to talk in the white oh, oil. Well. Okay. How's that? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I can talk louder. I just thought that would pick it up a lot better. Um, and the title of my research is
Uh, I started my apprenticeship in Adelaide at um, Nitty's Restaurant with uh, Lee Smith's West Legend and Tom Lou. And I worked at the Pheasant Farm with Maggie Beer <coughs> later on after finishing my apprenticeship. I came to Canberra about 18 years ago and I started a little tiny restaurant in Redhill Shops called Juniper. <coughs> Some of you may remember that restaurant. And then I got the catering contract at the National Gallery and I was there for about three years and then I got the catering contract at Old Parliament House. And I've just uh, moved from Old Parliament House. I've been there, was there for 11 years. And during my time there, I started uh, to get very, very interested in the connection to uh, food and farm, local farmers. So we tried, right from the start when I came to Little Juniper, I tried to get in touch with the local farmers and really use the local pro produce. <coughs> and at Old Parliament House, we started a shop called The Kitchen Cabin, which was a regional produce shop. And we used to have, um, Sunday dinners featuring the growers and uh, tell a story and like cook the food. And so it was a very kind of like interactive way to connect with people because that's part of my passion is making the connection from the farm to the plate, to, the, to people who eat. And the idea of, because I, I think that, that link is essential where cookery is the connection that makes farmers to consumers. And I think if Michael Pollan recently has written his book on cooking, and he talks about that too, where things there are, you know, the rules for cooking, like um, you can have as much junk food as you like as long as you cook it yourself. <laughs> and I, I like those ideas of if it comes through your car window, it's not food. So I, I really like those ideas. We recently moved from Old Pollan House, as I said, and we've got the catering contract at the National Library. And that's a very, very exciting venue, brand new venue for, for Canberra. And it's full of these amazing little trees, but it's also got this vision of the future for Canberra, and it's a very, very positive place to be, and like a beautiful building. And so we're there just starting off to um, develop some of the things that in the restaurant that we've got there, making connections with our local farms as well. I live on a farm um, about 20 kilometres south of Brayford. Uh, for a while there, I was raising Wissex Oakback pigs. And I've also got Reverie Dexter cattle. So I was trying to kind of like walk the talk of understanding what farmers do and how they do it. And my motivation was to grow the product because that way I could control the flavour. So for instance, my interest in ham got back to the idea of if I could grow the pig, <coughs> I could influence the flavour and have them free range. And so those ideas I, I find really, really interesting as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Liz Better. Um, my background uh, is, I suppose, as a, as a person who grew up in an uh, Italian-Irish family. Uh, when I was very little, um, we went back to Italy because I had to have some surgery that could only be done in Rome. And I got to experience the very end of my grandparents' life on their farm in the valley of um, Fortuna in the Abruzzi. And I have these vivid memories of these long tables where the 80 farm workers would be fed at lunch by my grandmother and my aunties. And it was all produce from that farm. It was all cooked that day or cured on the property. And the conversation and the, the way that arguments were settled, the children were raised. I mean, I remember, and I don't drink alcohol now, but I remember, you know, drinking the slops out of everybody's wine glass. And, you know, when I was probably under the age of three. Um, but that, that set up an expectation of my relationship between the land, food, and community. That is, I think, probably marked out my life and all the decisions that I've made. When we returned to Australia, I was fortunate that most of my father's cousins also had migrated to Australia. And so we, when we lived in Canberra, and Queanbeyan had these amazing Sunday lunches that would be at one or other of the auntie or uncle's places or cousin's places, where I learned to cook, where uh, the, you know, the men would be laying concrete or building a fence or whatever it was they were doing, the children were all running around completely mad and noisily, which is the way that Italian children are encouraged to be. And I learned so much about life and people, and again, it reinforced my sense of community. Um, 
I have had throughout my life, because of this condition I was born with, I've had to always be aware of food and, and really educate myself about food because I can't metabolise protein properly and so I have to constantly juggle my diet and, so that I don't get very sick. Um, in my 20s I moved to the coast. Uh, I was putting myself through two master's degrees and with my partner at that time, he was an artisan um, uh, pastry chef from Germany and we had a bakery in the coast for 11 years uh, and made everything from scratch, sourced as much local produce as we could and we'd have lots of people travelling from far and wide to come and, and, and get our wares. Um, I then started to work with nutritional companies uh, after I did a Masters of International Relations and Education which was all about how do you educate people to help themselves, help their communities and, and to do that through food and nutrition. Um, became very, very evangelistic during that period and very passionate about the lack of nutrition that's coming out of our soils and therefore you know, the lack of nutrition in the average person's <coughs> diet. They can eat as many calories as they want but they're just not getting the, the trace elements uh, that they need. Uh, in more recent times, I've been doing some work for the Maloon Institute over the last 18 months with a fabulous team, some of whom are sitting up the back. And we've really been looking at the trends that are driving agricultural research and the trends that are driving farming. And it's become very, very obvious that the thing that I treasured in my childhood, that sense of community, is the binder for food. And I passionately believe that without social cohesion, without people coming together, then you can have all the research you want around food and soil creation and all those things. People have to do it and people have to love doing it and people have to be connected doing it. So I'm sort of at the nexus of high-end research and let's get people together loving their food again, loving being part of how it's grown, seeing how it's grown and having great conversations around food. Thank you. Thank you. So. Oh, hello. I'm Sue Armstrong. We have a... Happy year. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a farm uh, just past Bangadur on the, <coughs> the way to Raywood, the Green Hill Farm. Um, so we're just simple farms. Um, we only we do beef, um, we do grass fed beef, and we do demitivide dynamic beef. And the reason we do that is because, and I must have a conversation with Helen, um, we totally agree with the idea that the way to improve the soil is definitely through grazing animals. Um, we our whole farm management is based around that principle. Our grazing management is based around that principle um, to regenerate the soil because nothing else matters except for the soil. So that's about all. Thank you. Okay, uh, my first uh, simple question goes to Janet. Um, what does local mean? Well, I think local is about um, the, the food our food ship where we get our where we go shopping, where we get our produce from. And luckily in Canberra being landlocked, we've got lots and lots of boundaries. So if you put the pin in the map and go, okay, that's the hundred mile local theme, then Canberra is an ideal place to get food from also the coast and the mountains and the terrific farming land all around us. So I can define that as our region. And uh, to any of the panel, I mean, 100, 100 kilometres, 100 miles, does the unit matter? I mean, obviously local means nearby, but how, how close is close? There's sort of a general idea of 220 kilometres kind of being the out boundary internationally that people talk about. Yeah, not 230. <laughs> <laughs> and, and again, it's going to be about some produce is going to be much easier to source closer in and, and again, depending on the position of the community, it's going to determine the lot. Um, it's been interesting looking at a lot of the movement, the urban agriculture movement. There's lots of things that we can grow in our community gardens, and they're the things that are highly consumable, that you need to have fresh every day. And then as you move out from that, you move into more of the animal husbandry, and then as you move out further, you go out into the grains, and things that need the broad acre farming. And Michael Pollan and I had a great conversation earlier in the year, which was <coughs> last year, I think about, which is all about that, you know, let's use our food miles sensibly. So the things that we can grow in our backyard, 
let's grow those. The things that you need more acreage for, let's have those around our cities. And the things that require big acreage, well, let's have those be the ones that use up the, the food miles. Because that means that we're getting a better usage of water, with I think one litre per calorie being water that we, we use to create our food, which is pretty horrific. And you know, the basis of the 70 calories of energy in terms of fossil fuels that we use for every calorie of food. So if we can prioritise and you know do things in a sensible, logical way and use the appropriate land for the appropriate produce, and I think that helps us to be local. So yeah, maybe out on the 300 k mark might be where your grains are coming from, but let's have our lettuce as close to us as possible. Um, yeah, David, uh, I was going to ask you to jump in on anything. Um, uh, can I be off local before you Yes, yeah, no, please. Can I just ask? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm going to be strict the early. No, sorry. See, the I'm talking about the same. Because sorry. so far I've only heard one okay. bird. Okay, okay. Well, and this, so okay. there's no point. Well, people are doing their best, so all the speakers so can try and speak in. Right, okay. How about if you do want people to speak a bit louder, um, how about something polite rather than can't hear you? It's, it's great that we've got yes, these people. Yes, Thank you. Uh, okay, so just, just thinking about local from my perspective, um, as, a, as a researcher, as someone who um, has the privileged position of, of sitting back and observing the world and in, in some sense trying to understand it and perhaps, um, perhaps share that understanding with other people. I've spent quite a bit of time in Europe and the Europeans are um, more organised, I guess, in, in many aspects of their food system, and certainly there's a lot more government involvement in, in most aspects of the food system. And, and they've tried to define what we can do. They've got projects going on at the moment in Europe about thinking about whether it's possible uh, or even sensible to come up with a, a label, some form of communicating local. And two things I'd share with you. One is that I've seen um, definitions used by different organisations, for instance, Farmers Market in the UK, they say local, and they define it as local, and it's, it's a requirement if you want to participate in that farmer's market as 30 miles, which is approximately 50 kilometres. So that's one example I've also seen a uh, supermarket in the UK say local is the, the, the country, in fact, anywhere within England. Um, so there's a, a range of different approaches to local. The, the, the most useful um, perspective that I came across was from the Soil Association, which is a large certification of organic food and activist organisation in the UK. And their view about local was more, it's a direction to be facing. So it's a, if, if my coffee is coming from 4,000, 10,000 kilometres, let's see if we can make it less, 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 less. So that was just something that I thought might be interesting to share. Dave, uh, what's the farmer's market's definition of local? Okay, uh, well that varies on the product. Uh, local tends to be the closest possible place for obtaining that product. So we, we regard Woomba as being local in terms of bananas. Though we're more local than that, but you can get bananas. You can get them from Cross Island. To get bananas, you have to go a long way away. That's as far as the farmer's market's concerned. It looks at what can, where, saying we want to get this range of fruit and vegetables, how, how wide do we have to cast the net to be able to get those things? And we can have a reasonable range. We don't want to have cherries in the middle of winter. We can't get them from anywhere in Australia. If you want to have mangoes now, mangoes are just starting to come in. Territory. So, if people <coughs> don't make mango eaters, then that would be about as low as you can get. Tomatoes, uh, it's not possible to produce tomatoes without some form of eating within 100 kilometres of Canberra in the middle of winter. It's just not possible. So, there's some tomatoes that come from eating greenhouses down around the uh, Sydney area. But <coughs> possibly more ecological are uh, field grown tomatoes that are shipped down from Queensland. Uh, what local means, uh, I, I don't really worry too much.
pretty much at that time when they used to tell him to I didn't actually say it thought that we tried to bring things in as close as possible to what we wanted to get. <coughs> and that's what that's what the manager is. Um, hold that thought, I'll come back to that one. But Sue, I just thought, what's the producer's perspective? Who, who do you want to sell your produce to? Anyone that wants to buy it? Or you oh, prefer to sell locally? Or? Um, I prefer to sell to people who appreciate what we produce. Um, our product is grass fed beef. It means it's not the same all year round because it's not really seasonal, but it is a little bit seasonal. Like this winter has been a very hard winter. It was a dry spring, it was a dreadful summer, it was a dry winter. The feed we use in winter actually comes from the spring before. So if it's not a good spring, you know, we haven't got such a good winter feed, it means the fat content, etc. etc. Now, if people want to have their five millimetre fat on their steaks all the time, they're not our customers. Our customers are people who understand that and appreciate what we do, how we do it, and the health of the food. Yeah. Um, David, I was going to ask you before, should I be buying imported organic food or locally non-organically produced food? <coughs> Uh, that's a good research question. That's a research <laughs> question that many PhDs will look at in the next decade and still, still won't get an answer. There's certainly, um, well, why would you want to buy local food as a consumer, as a marketing person? That's what I'm interested in. Why would you want to buy local food? And in contrast, why would you buy organic food? And are those two, are they overlapping or are they competing in actually different products? And certainly, um, to, to perhaps highlight the issue with a spectacular example, um, within the organic certification standards in the UK, there was a big issue um, about importing, in fact, air freighting organic beans from Africa into England. And the, the way the Soil Association accommodated or, or considered it, they said, it was legitimate under the organic standards to do that if there was a development benefit to the exporting country. So why something might seem totally crazy from a few miles carbon footprint perspective, there are many other aspects of what is a system, many other stakeholders, many other issues that, that can be considered. Um, my perspective of where consumers are living is that increasingly consumers are saying local in preference to organic. So to answer your question directly, I think more consumers are saying that yeah, I'll, I'll choose local and not organic rather than distant organic. A couple of years ago I read a fantastic article about some um, uh, local seafood. Uh, I think it was in Scotland, certainly in the UK. And they were catching fresh local seafood and they were packing it in ice now flying to Asia, it was getting peeled, and they're flying it back, and they were selling fresh local produce. <laughs> Done 20,000 kilometres in between, but um, quite from pain to play. Um, Janet, do, do the people in restaurants want to buy local? They do, and one of the big considerations about local food is flavour. So if it tastes better, because it's fresher, or has more nutritional value because let's face it, there's two reasons why, why we eat. It tastes good, so it's good for you. So you know, they're, they're, the, they're the main components that we'd always be looking for. And so if you are eating things which are in season and locally grown, you're going to cover those two things. Um, Helen, uh, where, where, where's the best place to get uh, our cattle from? Locally or in the Northern Territory? I think any question is it depends. <laughs> um, and it does come back, as Sue was saying, to how, how they're grown. Um, there is quite a bit of research on, well, probably not enough, but there is research showing that there is a greater nutritional value in grass-fed animals. Um, the, the point, I think, too, and, and it ties back to the local as well, is pretty much what you were saying with the seafood example, which I've come across as well. But when I did my master's, I um, expected to have organic come out as more environmental, more ecologically friendly. 
And it was finding out that, um, and this is from a soil perspective, and please don't anyone say that I'm bagging organics and organic production, because generally I think, and as Dave would, would say, um, these people who are growing this food really do care about their soil and they're nourishing it as much as they can. But there were people who were shipping in hay from Queensland or anywhere they could get organic hay because they didn't have enough grass on their properties. Um, the argument from an ecological perspective is if your supplementary feed, I'm interested in this comments on this, if you're supplementary feeding your animals, you probably, sorry, if you're supplementary feeding your animals, then you probably overgrazing your, your pasture, which is going to have a detrimental effect on the soil. Sometimes it can't be avoided. Um, and there are strategies that people can use, like sacrificial paddocks, that you'll say, well, I will. Still can't me. Okay. Um, so some people might say, well, we, we really can't support our herd um, by grazing in these ways, so we will feed them, but we won't run down all of our paddocks. We'll actually feed them more intensively in one until the situation improves. So um, I would prefer local. I would prefer grass-fed. But I think this comes back to the point of actually knowing your producer and, and actually going somewhere that you can be fairly confident that what you're getting is actually not just grass grown, but grass finished that it hasn't been, um, been, been later on finished off on grain. And you'll get a much higher nutritional, possibly not as tender, but if you're, inter if you're interested <laughs> in nutrition, then you can do it. I was supposing the wrong way, but that I think Sue might have something to say. Right. I have to finish that off. That sure. particular comment is from my partner, who I actually can't get to um, think that not quite as tender is, is a, a better trade-off for uh, nutrition <laughs> and ecological value. So, <laughs> well, she told me she was shy. Before, uh, I won't go into the tenderness um, thing, but uh, there were several points there. I think with this whole local eating local business, um, uh, organic business, etc., etc., etc. I think the food miles is a little bit misleading. Um, I think what really needs to be looked at for food in a very detailed manner is the life cycle analysis of the carbon footprint and the water footprint. And I think if you did that, you might be surprised at what food you should eat and what food you shouldn't eat. There was a few years ago um, in the UK, they probably know about this, um, there was a big thing about, oh, New Zealand land, we can't eat New Zealand land, the carbon footprint is horrendous. When it boiled down, when they did the full life cycle analysis, the land from New Zealand shipped, not flown, shipped to England had a lower carbon, foot, carbon footprint than the local stuff. It was the same with apples, because New Zealand can grow apples and lambs better than the UK. So I think that to say if you eat local, if your food miles is low, you're automatically being environmentally responsible is maybe not quite true. Um, what was the other thing? Oh yeah, well the um, supplementary feeding, I totally agree with you. We do not supplementary feed. We will not import food, um, you know, hay onto our place. If we had a really good season when we were able to cut our own hay, we would do that. But we will not import um, Hay for that reason, besides with damage biodynamics, very difficult and very expensive to get it, we will not bring it in from Western Australia. We will not bring in grain, we will not feed our cattle grain because you do not feed cattle grain. Full stop in the story, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Um, yes. Anyone this, here feeding their cattle grain? <laughs> this, this winter, we had to reduce our herd. We had to take out 30 cows. It's going to really hurt us in 18 months time when we do not have their project for sale. But it was a hard winter, we had to let them go. That's all there is to it. End of story. And we will have a shortage of our product in 18 months time. So if you buy our product, make sure you stop your friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, this is um, one of the consequences of eating locally and eating grass fed as opposed to grain fed. And also the, about the finishing of the grain, of when we started the farmers markets and we were grass fed, but now, <laughs> now, 
about, it's, it's really amazing the change in the consumer. The consumer has become so much more educated. Do you feed any grain is what they ask now. And that's the question to ask. There you go. Um, again, we'll, we'll certainly come back to these things, but I want to move the conversation on uh, a little bit to, um, uh, to Ken Canberra growing our food uh, to uh, support Canberra. Uh, I was actually going to ask you that question first, Elizabeth. What, what do you think? Can, uh, can, can and should Canberra grow its own food? I think, again, you have to be careful about sort of absolutist rules because it's going to depend on the season. It's going to depend on hard winters, bad springs, you know, good summers, whatever. That will influence what you can grow. Um, I think that if Canberra, Canberrans become and the region becomes more involved in the growing of food, then you end up with this, a more sustainable food community. And then that means you can maximise the opportunities that a good or poor season provide you. But it, and I think one of the big benefits of local that hasn't necessarily been touched on so far is the benefit socially um, and keeping farmers and being able to raise a generation of new farmers. One of the biggest challenges that we have is I think we're about 9,000 farmers a year short, year upon year. So we have an average age of 54 for <coughs> Australia's farmers and we have uh, increasing debt, falling profits. A lot of those farms are either being amalgamated into very large farms or are being subdivided into farmlets or urban. And every time you concrete over good farmland, that's a disaster for the future. And every time you do that, you're also losing all of that knowledge. And so what, if, if you set aside necessarily arguments about food miles and water and all of those things. The other really big benefit of local is that you keep that intellectual property and that knowledge of farming and of how to grow things and how to cure things and, and how to uh, get those products to the consumer. You keep them in your area. I know that in, in Italy, for instance, different valleys will specialise in a certain type of cheese or a certain type of prosciutto or your ham or whatever it might be, and they have gotten very good at, at hanging on to and passing on that artisan knowledge. And just as we don't want to lose that heritage seed or those heritage breeds, we don't want to lose that heritage knowledge. And so I think that's one of the big benefits of local. Janet, did you want to say something? Um, just a comment about, um, and I want to jump on this too. The, uh, a lot of our diets talk about eat less meat, like we should be eating plants, and so taking meat out of our diet rather than eating. We'll come back That's to that. That's the vegetarian yes. debate. Don't be culting my agenda. <laughs> <laughs> We're running the show tonight. <laughs> um, Dave, can Canberra grow enough food? Well, Canberra can grow enough food, depending on what type of food people want to eat. They're trying to gang up with Janet on here. <laughs> We certainly can't grow enough mangoes <laughs> uh, But Canberra could. I mean, one of the reasons the site was chosen for Canberra originally, if you look up the reasons for choosing this site, one of the reasons quoted was that it couldn't be self-sufficient in food. That, that was one of the reasons for choosing this site. Uh, it, it definitely can be self-sufficient. Whether it ever will be, whether people want it to be or not, is, is another question. I'd like to can I yeah, sure. quick, quickly agree very much with Elizabeth here that we are losing this intellectual capital. We are losing farmers, we are losing information. People tend to think that growing things on the land is just a matter of going out there and paying anyone can do it. It's not that is not the case. In all the years that I've been growing vegetables, I'm still learning every year. And some things we still don't get, we still don't have properly <coughs> under control. I remember complaining one time very early in the days of the farmer's market to Joe Vassella, who's from Melbourne Park, the biggest of the vegetable producers at the Capital Region Farmer's Market. And I said, Joe, look, I just can't get the <coughs> celery growing properly. And he said, it takes years to grow celery properly. So it took me six years to learn how to grow.
got to watch for the Clintons. That this is one of the biggest problems that the farmers got. When he's gone, he's going to grab the Osprey Clintons one day when the farmers buy the one one win. There's the, a terrific danger of us losing this knowledge. <coughs> I'm sure there's a few relieved people in here that have killed a few plants in their backyard. Um, Dave? Okay, so addressing the issue of um, <coughs> and can be self-sufficient in terms of its production and consumption, associated with consumption of food. Well, if we look at the situation now, and we take a fairly broad definition of Canberra, if we may say that sort of a 100 kilometre or 100 mile diet, um, we, what we know is that that region produces more red meat, so beef and sheep, more wheat than is actually consumed, so it exports those products. It's approximately self-sufficient in dairy products and all other food products it's a net importer of. So that's the situation today. What we want it to look like in 10, 20, 50 years time is a matter for discussion. It's a matter for people to ponder. I guess I sense that there is value, um, minor environmental value, major um, social value, and pro probably some economic value, particularly from a more of a resilience than a short term problem perspective, in all regions having a degree of productive capacity in relation to food. And whether you think that should be you know, 5%, 70%, 100% is really a, an interesting discussion, but I think there is value uh, in having a degree of uh, self-sufficiency, degree of self-sufficiency, particularly around staple food products, okay, the ones that really supply the bulk of the calories and the nutrition for that uh, population of this country. Helen, climate change will make this easier, won't it? There will grow a lot more mangoes <laughs> not make it easier but I think if we come back again to the soil and I'm probably going to be including so if anyone wants to play soil uh, bingo I'm sure <laughs> you'll be doing well um, is we come back to the idea of having healthy soil being more resilient and so addressing climate change really is about um, and this is way too simplistic but um, getting everything working as well get the ecology working, get the soil working, so that we're buffered a little bit from climate change impacts, that we're not having the um, possibly feast and famine type of thing. But, but one of the, um, and it's probably not necessarily the question that you want me to answer now, and I can come back to it, but what I did want to say on that previous question was um, people growing their own food that we haven't really touched on yet. And again, it comes back to what um, some of the other panellists were saying as well, is there's so much in being involved in food, in, in growing food, and, and I'm not a backyard gardener. I, I have had a, a couple of attempts. I had a failed attempt with my brother when I was about 10, and I think that put me off growing food forever. Um, but a couple of years ago, um, I, I had a reasonably successful backyard garden, and I had broccoli that didn't look like broccoli, but it tasted fantastic. But what I discovered was the joy of actually browsing the garden. And I think a lot of people can um, grow their own food, whether they're in apartments in pots or whether they want to have a roof garden or a little bit of a plot out the front and getting away from some of the ideas of gardens as being purely uh, recreational, but this is recreation as well, but gardens not being something to look at. So I think there's movements in some overseas cities to actually have edible gardens in the streets. So we're not just having plain trees or elms, that we actually can grow some edible plants in the streets. And, and I think that's another very social way of connecting people back to their food. So I do think that um, Canberra, even not the greater Canberra region, could become self-sustaining, but I think there's a bit of social engineering that probably needs to happen to get it there. And it will help us with climate change. There's plenty of communal plum trees around. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it comes back to what we were talking about before, as a bit of a you know, sense of community in food. Do we, do we need to 
we need to grow food in the community gardens? Do we need to swap food with our next door neighbours? Do we need to put gardens on the roofs of CBD buildings? And that well, well I, think that, I think that's what communities need to decide. Um, you, we're not just saying it overseas. Um, there are quite a lot of pots in, in CB, CBDs around Australia where people are growing food together, where they're growing in verges, they're growing in community gardens, um, and there'll be a display at Florian this year uh, around uh, that, which is definitely worth people having a look at. Um, I, I think that food is something to be shared, and the whole idea of, you know, you might be preserving, your neighbour might be curing, someone else is growing onions and garlic, and, and you provide each other with that exchange, which is the foundation of civilization. It's how we began this whole journey was the exchange of things to each other that we needed. And if we can, the big mistake in, in every product development is when it becomes commodified, and that's when prices plummet, and quality plummets, and then it's survival of the fittest in terms of who can produce the most for the least, and how do you rape and pillage the, the labourers and the land in order to do that. So you end up with you know, capitalised profits and socialised uh, costs, and we're seeing that throughout the world right now as economies crumble. I think food is something much more fundamental than a commodity, and if we can get back to the idea of food as, as conversations, food as things that are exchanged, we'll get to know our neighbours, that's for sure. And as the cost of fossil fuels and water rises, and we are less able to move these things over great distances, we will become necessarily interdependent. And, and so I, I think there's a couple of books around right now that are saying, you know, what's happening in the world may not be for the worst. What if what's happening in the world actually makes the place better? What if being taken off the, you know, the dummy of fossil fuels uh, makes us get to know our neighbours and share knowledge with the ageing, you know, um, Vietnamese or Italian man or woman on the corner who's been growing their veggies their whole life and we actually ask, can I help you? Can you teach me? Maybe we might end up with a, a much happier society. Um, so, yes, there are these threats, but maybe we can see them as opportunities. There are two things that disturb me about this. One of them is that um, farming or farmers are kind of regarded as a bit of a scratchy existence. And it's something which, you know, a, a status symbol is that you can actually afford to go shopping. You, you can afford to make those choices. And the other thing that disturbs me is how much food we waste. So we buy food and then don't eat it, throw it away. I mean, you, you've got some research on that. Yeah, well, this, oh, no segue. It's like we reversed this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the, the Australian Institute did some research. Uh, we've done it a couple of times in the amount of money people spend on food they buy and chuck out without using. Now, I know no one in here does this, uh, but the other people, uh, <laughs> um, the other Australians chuck out about $5 billion a year in food. They buy it. Think of the water that went into it, the energy that went into it, the transport that went into it, the energy to leave it in your fridge long enough for it to rot, and then they chuck it out. Not you guys. <laughs> Five billion dollars a year, and that's just home. That's not commercial food waste. That's not catering food waste. That's, that's just in our own homes. But um, we have got a question uh, from the audience that goes to exactly this point. So you really did uh, chime in to the good point there, Janet. And I, I think I'll throw it to uh, uh, I think I'll throw it to Helen so she can win the bingo. Um, <laughs> can we use organic waste? the organic waste we currently produce to create soils that will become the basis for community gardens. Is it viable to look at rooftop gardens and unused green spaces? And is all the spare space that we've got, uh, is that enough uh, to, to grow enough to feed the campus population? You don't have to answer all those bits, but uh, is, is all that food that we chuck out, is that good soil going to waste? Absolutely, that's a massive loss of nutrients to the soil and um, when you're talking about chucking it out, remember there's also a lot of nutrients that we flush away even after we eat it. So um, there is research going on onto how um, particularly the biosolids can actually be um, put back into agriculture and there's 
Again, you get into. Are you water. talking about poo? I'm talking about poo. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the, talking about poo. <laughs> yeah. um, and one of the um, the issues with it uh, um, is actually making sure because also with the poo that we flush away with the nutrients. I think you've got a question at the back there, Richard. Um, but um, is the other things that we ingest. We ingest antibiotics, we ingest hormones, we ingest all sorts of pharmaceuticals, and that all gets flushed down as well. So before we can actually recycle that and put it onto food growing systems, we actually need to make sure that it's safe to do it, that, that it doesn't have toxins in it that the plants are going to take up, that's actually going to poison the soil. So there's a lot of salts. The last thing we want to do is put more salt on Australian soil. So there are issues with it, but with the organic wastes, um, the fresh wastes, if you like, that we haven't recycled through our bodies, which would normally make them highly compostable and desirable for the soil. Um, all of that should go back into the soil. That's the natural system. It should cycle. It should be returned to the soil where it gets decomposed and then taken up again. So um, yes, there's, there's work going on. At the local scale, I think, is the perfect way to do it, in community gardens, in your own backyards. Um, being very time poor and having a very small yard so we don't really have room to compost. Um, one of the things that amazes me, once, probably once or twice a week, we take all of our green waste out and we just dig a small hole and bury it. And it's amazing how quickly it disappears. A corn cob will disappear in you know, a month, two months. Yeah, we don't have a great garden, we don't have great soil, but the biology of that, they're doing some amazing work. Dave, so, would you like us to all bring our rubbish out to your place? <laughs> well, there would be problems if people bring their rubbish out to our place because we're certified organic and other than that we when we brought the stuff out to our place that uh, had been known chemicals that were, we were not allowed to have on our land, we shouldn't have on our land, in, in that room. That's one of the problems with this, that people do use uh, all sorts of herbicides, insecticides and whatever, and we can't take those, that organic waste and put that into our vegetable garden because we'd be incorporating those pesticides <coughs> into our garden. That, that's, one of the, that's one of the problems. Uh, we, we bring back our own, all of our own organic waste from everything from chop by Joe, which is not sold, it's organic, it comes back to our farm and gets recycled in the soil. Anything that we have that is not up to scratch to send into it. So the supermarket doesn't care if you waste your food. The food pro food producers don't care if you waste your food. Uh, and of course they don't mind if you overeat either. So I think there's incredible economic pressures uh, on us when uh, it comes to the issue of information. But um, I've, I've polled this, you know, 90% of people think we should ban junk food advertising during children's viewing hours. 90% of Australians think that putting ads for junk food on when kids are watching television is a bad way to set up the habits that, that David is talking about. But here we are in the middle of an election campaign, and I guarantee you that no major party is going to want to talk about banning junk food ads during TV. Because that will really upset some people that make a lot of money selling some sugary food in, in, in large quantities. So I think you know it's great to sit back and do what we've done tonight, which is think about well, how could we improve the system? But let's be clear, there's some people making a lot of money out of the system that isn't generating those outcomes. And, uh, David's, uh, Dave's already had a round of applause tonight, so I won't single him out again, but, I, uh, but as an economist, I, I admire him for encouraging us all to go into our own backyard business and grow our own stuff so that we don't have to buy as much from other people, because that's the exact opposite of the business model uh, that economists assume exist. So, um, just a, a couple of plugs. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, tonight, uh, well, tonight wouldn't have been possible without uh, some, some hard-working organisers. 
So Genevieve and, and Ryan, where are you guys? Sitting at the back, yes. Uh, can we please start with you? Um, I don't think I've got the list here, Serena, but the Canberra Environment Centre is putting on a number of it's workshops. behind you. It's behind you. <laughs> right. it's, uh, it's like a pantomime. It's behind you. Um, uh, so let me just read them, uh, read them out for you. Uh, preserving the Harvest Workshop, if you want to know how to preserve the abundance that Janet was talking about. Uh, seasonal Cooking Class. Uh, with uh, with uh, Warren Winter, the chef, uh, making salami workshop. Um, I don't know how you make salami. So I guess. <laughs> 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 exactly. Uh, and an, organ an organic gardening workshop. So if you're interested in food, uh, if you want to learn more, or you heard you heard from Dave, you heard uh, from Sue. You know, it takes skill and experience to grow food, to produce food, to preserve food. And if, those, if that knowledge has been lost somewhere along the line, it's not too late to get it back. And, you know, uh, workshops like that uh, are obviously a fantastic way to do it. So, uh, so uh, thank you to the Canberra Environment Centre uh, for putting tonight on. Thank you in particular uh, to Genevieve and Ryan. Um, as I said before, the Australia Institute, we've got some research coming out on, on food production in the home and in the community gardens. And all of our research is, is free online, the stuff I was talking about, food waste, um, all those things, uh, uh, they're, they're all available if you're interested. But uh, if you want to get a copy of that paper when it comes out, if you, as I said, if you sign up on the thing, we'll, we'll email you a copy. But, um, uh, but thank you for coming along. Thank you to the people that put in the questions. Sorry to the odd person that was waving your hand around, but uh, I, I was trying to get through as many of them. The, the pre-submitted questions as they could. So let's save the best to last. Can you please join me in thanking our fantastic...